Yeah, I guess uh, maybe by the end of this lecture, you'll be pretty tired of me <laughs> for today. <but laughs> um, <coughs> uh, so, so I hope you you can come back to this uh, skirmion model, the the topological soliton model, and I just. Uh, to finish this, I wanted to mention this line of activity about infinite nuclear matter that, uh, that basically, usually nuclei are not solids, right? They're liquid-like, but, but in the large end limit, if you think about what's happening as I wrote down here, both the mass and the interaction potential interaction potential is also of order n just like the mass and this is uh, not hard to see from this classical field picture so uh, so basically they become frozen and uh, the fluctuations around this frozen configuration are relatively small. So then what you typically get is some kind of crystal, like the simplest one. So you can start with a configuration where these are the centers of solitons. If you, for example, draw the energy density for this soliton, uh, this is computable from this model, and you find that that uh, the soliton energy density uh, it basically looks like this. It's really a lump of energy. And here it decays like e to the minus m pi times r, because there are basically these pi and tails that uh, characterize the soliton. So they're sort of localized uh, to the size on the scale of Fermi. Okay, so you can imagine doing the following thing. You can uh, start, start with this uh, configuration um, where they're pretty far apart at large distance. And it turns out that they need to be uh, rotated somehow relative to each other. Because once you have this classical solution, you classical, you can also rotate it by some overall rotation. And the energy of interaction between nearest neighbors depends on how you rotate it. Uh, and this is described in my 1985 paper called Nuclear Matter and the SCARM Model. Uh, it's been a while. <laughs> but, uh, right, so, so you have to choose some rotations and you start with these localized lumps, but they start attracting. And then the question is what happens? So. So after many months of doing some kind of numerical minimization subject to some cubic symmetry, I found the following curve that if you, if you take uh, uh, the uh, interaction energy, E interaction as a function of volume per, volume per baryon number, per baryon in Fermi cube, you get some kind of curve which, like there is attraction at large distances, then they get compressed and there is some, some minimum that actually happens. And at this point they're already very distorted, so you get some distorted configuration. And this, uh, so here if you look at where it's minimized, it's of course, as I said, these models have to be taken with a grain of salt because they're uh, not fully quantitative, but you find something about on the order of five, uh, five cubic Fermi per nucleon. And this is actually more dense than the center of nu uh, nuclei. In nuclear matter, you get something like, uh, in, in nuclear matter, mm. matter you get, uh, something like about six Fermi cubed uh, per, per baryon. So this is already at the somewhat higher density 
And then people actually, rather than simple cubic, you can assume some other crystalline symmetry. So this turns out to be not optimal. Uh, but the idea of this crystal does, uh, does appear to work. And you can say, <coughs> well, obviously this is not so physical, right? Because it doesn't look like the nuclei that we know. But uh, one can hope that if you go to the core of, of neutron star where there may be density higher than nuclear density, there could be some crystalline state of, of uh, neutron matter. So this is where, where this may have some some physical application. So, so in fact, if you, I think if you read papers about, it's a big mystery what, what happens in the core of neutron star, right? So, so core of neutron star, <coughs> I'm far from expert on it, but uh, core of neutron star. We don't know what is in there. There could be basically something like quark matter. Quark matter. Or neutron crystal. Uh, or some, something called pion condensate or kaon condensates. Or <coughs> yeah, this, this actually is sort of like a pion condensate because you have periodic waves of pions uh, around by definition, kind of the way you describe this, this situation. So now people are talking about equation of state of neutron stars again because of these uh, gravity wave results and apparently they may provide some information about equation of state. So gravity wave, uh, when you have neutron star merger, neutron star merger with black hole, uh, so gravity waves, waves from neutron star merger. may provide some info on, on uh, which of these, on what you have here, in particular on the equation of state at high density. Yeah, usually here <coughs> you have this hardcore repulsion. That's a pretty robust feature of the fact that you put in a higher derivative term. So once you compress it too much, the energy starts to go pretty rapidly, go up. But precisely where it stabilizes, it's really not known. So, <coughs> so this is one, one interesting application where, where this large N model may kind of capture in spirit what, <coughs> what, what is happening physically. OK, so, so now. Uh, so now, a lot of you, I think, are wondering why are so many people doing large n? Because n, after all, is equal to three, <laughs> right? And uh, and you're expanding. If it were pure glue theory, you are expanding in one over three squared, which is sort of smallish. But once you have these qu uh, flavors, you're really expanding in one third because there are 1 over n corrections rather than 1 over n squared corrections. It's a perfectly good thing to worry about. I'm starting to worry about it myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but just to encourage a little bit uh, this line of work, you can basically do the following. And this is what some people have been doing for years now, which is uh, let us just take, say, pure, <coughs> pure glue theory in three dimensions, which is relatively under control. So, uh, and this is something that uh, people like mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the next uh, comment is uh, validity of 1 over n squared. 
solidity of 1 over n expansion expansion okay so what can you do to try to convince yourself that it works pretty well well if suppose you take the simplest non-trivial confining theory on the lattice say uh, d equals 3 Euclidean Euclidean uh, pure glue theory pure glue I trust you had the uh, lectures here on lattice gauge theory right so you, you you probably know roughly what what this is so the continuum action will be just minus uh, minus 1 over 2 g young mills squared Right, integral d3x trace f mu nu squared. Okay, and here, just on dimensional grounds, you see that uh, g young mills uh, squared has dimensions of mass, has dimensions of mass. Okay, <coughs> and then you, you basically want to check uh, whether the Stroft scaling is obeyed well even at moderate values of n, right? <coughs> so, so you can, for example, do, uh, so you expect from, uh, from Troft reasoning the following thing. You expect that m, uh, so, so what, uh, Hoff taught us is uh, so you expect at large n the following that that the mass of say glue some glue balls mass of glue ball which is the only type of bound state that you can have in this pure glue theory will have the trivial factor g and mil squared n and then it will have some expansion like uh, let's call it uh, a0 plus a1 over n squared plus a2 over n to the 4 and so on and this expansion is basically from from this plane uh, from this argument that I presented this expansion is guaranteed to work pretty well when n is large but how large Right, uh, an optimist would say it uh, should be there, like say for n equal five. But a pessimist would say, what if this coefficient is huge? I have, I can go, uh, may have to go to n equal a thousand forty, like what I had in in the model yesterday, <laughs> right? And that really would be not so nice, right? Uh, so, so then. Uh, so this is the expectation and then another quantity that people compute is the string tension that I mentioned the string tension should have the same type of expansion uh, string tension uh, we'll have say T T uh, fundament funda in fundamental representation let's just say square root of T just so it has dimension. Tension has dimensions of energy squared, right? Because it's energy per unit length. So square root of string tension will uh, also have like g mil squared n times a similar expansion b0 plus b1 over n squared. And you can basically try to then, uh, then what people do is they try to solve theories for n equal to just solve directly the theories solve uh, for n equal to 2, 3, 4 okay and basically plot the results as a function of 1 over n squared if the results look pretty linear then, then we're in business Right, and uh, go up to as far as you can, like. And people who are working in this direction are uh, Senadoro, uh, Doro, 
uh, and Tepper. They've written some very elaborate papers on this, and I think they're still continuing. Uh, and I want to show some results uh, that they obtained numerically. Sometimes they just plot, I think, so if you plot, for example, the dimensionless quantity m glue ball, glue ball divided by square root of this string tension, then, then this g and mil squared n will cancel out, and you should get something like c naught plus c1 over n squared plus dot dot dot. Okay, and so I'll show the results. Uh, yeah, these are the results. And they, they can compute uh, glue balls in various channels, like a spin zero, some higher spin. And basically, you see that at low, uh, yeah, so if you go to so large 1 over n squared is, so this point 1 over n squared is a quarter, so this is n equal 2, and then they go to higher and higher. And you see that the results for low-lying states are actually very good, right? Like, for example, this one is pretty linear, so it means that the effect of this, uh, the next, so even the, effect of this term, it's small for at least low-lying glue balls, lying states. Then usually as you go up it can get a little worse, but, but here they, they actually look very linear for even excited states. So I think you, you should be pretty impressed by this. <laughs> because, because you would say just from n equal 2 and 3, you could already sensibly extrapolate to the infinite end limit. The infinite end limit is just the value here, right? Uh, so I think this, this is pretty remarkable, at least in, uh, in one dynamical gauge theory. Granted, it's not the theory we're most interested in, but this, this works. Well, these are just fits. I think the purple lines are, they fit, they fit, they do some kind of best fits to, to this expansion. Okay, so uh, I, uh, if, if I understand correctly, uh, the blue dots are just the numerical values. Then they try to fit the purple lines to, for some range of n to more or less this expansion. And, uh, and you can fit with just, I think, three coefficients typically. Like if it were, ex if it looks exactly linear, that means that this coefficient is zero, right? But it, it, they bend a little, but uh, not too much. Right, so, the uh, so that means that even, f it means that this coefficient is sufficiently small that you don't see the bending even for n equal to three or four. Right, not a thousand three or. Yeah. And mm. So in the first uh, the first state is only one point. Then there are two. Then there are three. Uh, no, this is the same. Uh, this is the result for n equal two of the spectrum. This is the spectrum for n equal three. This is but the spectrum. For example, for n equal three. Mm -hmm. First, I have one point, but then I have then I have two points which are very similar. Yeah, yeah. M I mean, these are the details of the spec excitation spectrum. The, I think these are just all the states that they can extract with the spin zero. You're asking why are they so close? Then it's more. Y there may be some dynamical explanation for why they. Yeah. The yeah, yeah. Some small split. Yeah. Right, there, there may be, yeah, it could be that these states are supposed to be exactly degenerate, but I mean, you can look in their paper, it's a long paper, and they have, uh, uh, they, also, they also do it for other spins, like they, 
Yeah, so for spin two, you see more bending, right? Like the ground state, you see a bit more parabolic, but still it's, it seems like they are able to fit it just with these three coefficients. Uh, and, uh, oops. Yeah, so, so that, that's, um, that's basically the vote of confidence, small vote of confidence in this business. And th they've also done d equal 4. For d equal 4, it's harder, right? Because in d equal 3, th there is already this dimensionful quantity, right? But in d equal 4, you, you have to get the scale through the dimensional transmutation, this lambda QCD. But I think the results they obtain are still fairly encouraging. Uh, and. Uh, Okay, so so that's that's one thing that I wanted to mention. So this means that in a conf confining type theory, you can really get discrete spectrum. Yeah, what we don't know, of course, is how to describe this one over an expansion through some kind of analytical means. The like, for example, in this ON theory, we could get one of our n corrections analytically using this sigma field trick, but in these more complicated theories where you have to include all the planar graphs, we don't know how to solve it analytically. But the numerical solutions support the idea of, of this expansion being quite good. Okay, so now I wanted to talk about, uh, try to make a bit of a connection between what I was doing in the first lectures and uh, these Toff type theories. Uh, and this has to do with uh, so-called uh, so called uh, caswell banks zax theories. So basically, remember that, uh, uh, first of all, are there any questions on this? Because I will switch a little bit the topic. Yes, so, so now I will, so remember what I was doing initially is in this ON model, for example, very established stuff is how for, there are these uh, CFTs or fixed points, fixed points in uh, D equal to four minus epsilon that can be co uh, just computed analytically. And there we can compute, for example, uh, and they're weakly coupled, right? Remember we had some uh, beta function for, for G, right? There was minus epsilon G plus some term of order G squared, which was positive. And then you obtain that G at the fixed point is of order epsilon, right, is of order epsilon. So if you plot this beta function, uh, there is this very weakly coupled and non-trivial zero here, right? And, th and this is what allowed us to do controlled expansions for delta. So we can, so this gives us a weakly coupled CFT. But the somewhat un weird feature of it is, of course, people always ask, what does it mean to be in this four minus epsilon dimension? You know, it's, it's per se not a f maybe fully, it's a, it's a kind of formal trick, but maybe we sh should not think too hard. We just develop the expansion and extrapolate it to epsilon equal one, and there it makes sense. That's the philosophy. But sometimes there is something like this happening directly in four dimensions. And this is called the, the caswell banks X theory. So, that, so in, in non-abelian theory, in for example SUN uh, uh, gauge theory, gauge theory with, uh, with NF uh, fermions, Fermions. 
This can happen directly in D equal 4. Directly in D equal 4. But then you need to do something a bit extra because if you look at this, you don't, if you look just at pure glue theory or this theory with a small number of of nf, it obviously doesn't happen, right? Like this, this coefficient is large and there is nothing like this. But there is another large end limit that you can take called the Veneziana limit, another famous name. Okay, so, so you need the Veneziana limit. Veneziana limit, right, where, where you basically take n to infinity and at the same time you keep the ratio of the number of flavors to, uh, to the number of colors fixed, right? So you're keeping, keeping the parameter x, which is nf, nf divided by n fixed. In other words, you're simultaneously taking, taking nf and n, both flavor and the color numbers to infinity with some fixed ratio, right? And, and in that limit, you can find some very interesting things. Okay, by, um, by, x, by tuning x. It turns out that if you tune x, you, uh, you can do something very interesting. So let's just think about this b naught now. So this b naught can be written as 11 thirds, 11 thirds n times 1 minus 2x over over 11, right? This is just just an identity. But then I also need the two-loop coefficient. It's, very, it's also important to know what's going on with this two-loop coefficient. So there is a general formula which was computed shortly after this paper, I think in uh, within months from this paper. In particular, Cass Caswell, I think, computed it first, who was at the time a graduate student at Princeton. So he, the result you get is uh, for this series that B1 is equal to 34 thirds n squared minus 10 thirds, 10 thirds n and f, and f minus 4, n squared minus 1, divided by 2n, by 4, I think 4n times n f. That's, in fact, this is known in terms of these uh, Casimir's and the Din Dinkin label. Right, but I'm already just simplifying it. Th this is a well-known formula you can, for example, in Weinberg's uh, QFT book, you, you can look up this formula. Okay, and this can be, uh, so in this Veneziana limit, you can, for example, this just simplifies. You can ignore this one because you're taking n to infinity. But here, now you cannot ignore nf, right? So, so you get uh, so this becomes uh, n squared over three. Uh, this becomes n squared over 3 times uh, 34 
minus 13x. OK, and this x, uh, x can play a big role. Like if x is small, right, if x is 0, and you're just doing pure glue theory, then you see that both B, B0 and B1 are positive, which means that the beta function is negative. So B1 just acts to further enhance asymptotic freedom, right? Uh, both terms make the beta function negative. So for so for n equal for n f for x equals zero, you basically get the beta function just looks like this, right? Including these two terms, and and people people know higher coefficients, although there is some scheme dependence business, but mm -hmm. but now let's do the following trick, which is. Uh, if you look at what we did in the epsilon expansion, we wanted to keep the leading term small and negative, right? And this we can actually arrange by making x just slightly smaller than, than 11 halves. So, so let's consider the situation when, uh, when x is... Uh, x is equal to 11 halves minus epsilon. And this people uh, often call the Banks-Zaks or caswell banks zaks expansion. Banks-Zaks. Okay, then you will, you will see that this term here, so B naught is slightly positive, which means this coefficient is negative, right? But, uh, but this one will change sign, right? So if you plug in x equal to 11 halves, this is firmly negative, which means uh, this, this becomes uh, uh, it becomes basically so this so in this limit, this becomes minus n squared, minus n squared times uh, 75 over 6. OK, so then when you, if you plot here, then you actually do find uh, th this type of situation. OK, and you can. Uh, Try to solve. So now this term is positive, and this term is very, very slightly negative, right? So you can balance them against each other, and you find that the, the solution. Th so this fixed point sits at g star squared n over four pi squared is equal to for epsilon divided by 75. But the main thing is that it's, it's of order epsilon, right? So it's parametrically small. You can, you can basically, you can basically say that you can create a family of theories which be approach more and more weakly coupled fixed points. Yeah, yeah, that means that uh, for this type of beta function, so this is the free UV theory here, right? And this is the interacting IR theory. So you, the flow lines go like this. The interacting IR theory is very weakly coupled. And this is what's called the weak, that's the weakly coupled end of the conformal window. There is some uh, range of x, right? Uh, where where this theory will stay conformal. Okay, we don't know what is the lower bound on x. So so we have this. Some people call it conformal window of uh, conformal window is when uh, so here x is equal to eleven halves 
and then it extends here and then it ends somewhere. And this we don't know. So this is x upper and this is x lower. And this is a big question mark because the theory becomes rather strongly coupled. Okay, but this is something that actually many lattice people are still working on, like what is the lower edge of conformal window. And uh, so this, this analytic argument is, uh, is in the large end limit, but people are somewhat interested, for example, in SU3 theory. Okay, and SU3 theory, uh, this is actually what Caswell's paper was about. It's a very short and beautiful paper. He basically pointed out the following thing, that if you look at this, uh, uh, at this one loop coefficient, so now let's take, for example, the case of SU3. Right, this one loop coefficient will be just 11 minus 2 thirds NF. That means that, uh, that the theory is asymptotically free, so for n equal 3, for n equal 3, the, there is uh, asymptotic freedom, freedom, namely B naught stays positive for, for NF less than 33 halves, right? But then, s so, if you take an f equals 16, it's ex and this is 16.5, right? So there is an almost cancellation, right? It's like working with small epsilon. And basically he checked, he computed the two-loop coefficient, uh, I mean for nf less than 33 halves. So what Caswell did is he checked uh, the case nf equals 16, and showed that the effective coupling strength there is really very small. So, so you, there is every reason to trust that, uh, that the higher, because you can worry, what about not the two loop, but the three loop coefficient? Can that screw it up? It cannot if epsilon is very small. And here, you check that it's very small. So any reasonable three loop coefficient will not change it. Right, so. So this, this was this Caswell's paper. And this was in some sense the discovery of the first four dimensional interacting fixed point. Because uh, as I mentioned, Wilson and Fisher in their review, they posed this question, can we have a four dimensional fixed point or scale invariant theory? And they spent many pages on this. But they didn't yet know that in non-abelian theory there is this negative term. In some sense, the greatest discovery in quantum field theory of, I don't know, the last how many years, 50 years or something, is this, the fact that there is this minus 11 thirds n. Because people before then basically thought that it's always positive. And if it's always positive, how are you going to get a zero of a beta function? You just can't. But, but here you get this negative coefficient. The f ordinary matter gets a plus number. And then you can also balance them against each other to create this weakly coupled infrared fixed point. Right, right. So, so that, that was... Uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, they will not be confined, right. Yeah, I think this is a prototype for what you mean uh, by non-confining fully scale invariant theory in four dimensions. It also has, uh, it of course has this SU, so there is no chiral symmetry breaking or anything of the sort, right. There is a very high degree of global symmetry because there are, for example, this, this theory, right, that's going to have, I guess, SU 
16 cross S U 16 symmetry right down. Or like the, this this particular theory. So so one. Uh, Yeah, one, one thing that people do worry about is how to determine the lower end. In fact, there, is, there are two lines of attack. One is to add supersymmetry, and then there are these so-called uh, cyborg conformal window. In that case, it's known exactly where this ends, in the supersymmetric case. So in, in Susie's case, uh, so if you do the supersymmetric version, you you basically get that uh, in n equal one supersymmetric theory, then you know that this x uh, begins with three here. That's the upper end, and it extends exactly to three halves. And then something happens. Basically, below here, below this x, I think what happens is like what I described. You no longer have a zero of the beta function, so there will be some kind of dynamical behavior. Like there may be walking behavior, like the beta function is very small, and then, but slowly it will flow to, to the infrared. So it's a kind of, Basically, here you can say that this theory is, in some sense, weakly confining. Namely, confinement scale is very low. It, it will have, in some sense, light uh, bound states. And this is pretty hard to distinguish on a fi finite lattice from, uh, from uh, truly conformal theory, right? And conformal theory just the, the, there is no binding. The binding washes away. But I think it's a very subtle numerical question and, and many people are working on it. From what I, I actually don't know the latest, but I think the fact that the numerical check of Caswell's result, that an F equals 16 series conformal, that very quickly came, I think. And then people I think for an f equal 14, it also definitely looks uh, looks conformal and even 12. But I think the main question is about 10 and lower. Yeah, I mean, we certainly think that an f equal 3, 4, that's definitely confining. It's not clear if, I don't know if an f equal 10, uh, 10 is completely settled, but at least there is some small range of parameters where, where this is. Is basically okay. So this is a, a very useful thing for theoretically minded people who like to study what goes on, like whether you can have a fully scale invariant theory and so on. Any questions? Or Okay, so this is one one way of uh, of trying to to create a fixed point is by adding flavors and tuning their number. Okay, but uh, another way is to choose some extended supersymmetry. Then another way is to add supersymmetry and then tune flavors. Right? For example, uh, if you take uh, uh, yeah, if you take a single so for example one one uh, commonly discussed theory is pure pure n equal one supersymmetric theory, right? For for the pure n equal one supersymmetric theory, the B naught is eleven thirds n minus two thirds n. 
right and we So the n equal one supersymmetric theory is when you have this uh, the a mu, right, and also you have a Majorana fermion. Have a Majorana fermion in the in the joint representation. So this is also a joint and the supersymmetry is relating them. Then this coefficient B naught is equal to 11 thirds N and the single Majorana fermion is gives minus 2 thirds N. And this you get to be 3N. That's why in the in the N equal to Susie case you get this 3 instead of 11 halves or yeah so the the beta function coefficient kind of looks nicer okay but you see that it's not enough the theory is still asymptotically free so it will still flow right so the then you can try n equal 2 supersymmetry and then uh, there are then also joint scalar fields. Then there are, uh, there is uh, a mu, psi, and, uh, and two adjoint scalars, phi 1 and phi 2. These are two adjoint scalars. Then the, we know the contribution of a joint scalar. Also, each one contributes uh, 1, 6, n to the beta function. So then B0 becomes 11 thirds n minus uh, 4 thirds. Uh, yeah, now there are two, two of these. This becomes complex. And uh, psi 1 and psi 2. And then there is this one. So you get 11 thirds minus 4 thirds minus uh, 2 times 1, 6. Each adjoint scalar contributes 1, 6. And this gives us exactly 2n. So still not, uh, still not 0, right? And then finally, we can consider the, the so-called n equal 4 supersymmetric theory. And the n equal 4 supersymmetric theory so when you take the n equal 4 supersymmetric law dynamics, then what is the field content? There is this a mu. There are four, four uh, wild fermions, wild fermions, psi, uh, psi i, and then there are six scalars, six scalars, uh, phi i, where i runs from one to six. Okay. And that turns out to be exactly right to cancel the, the beta function because then you get like B naught is n times 11 thirds minus uh, 4 times 2 thirds minus 6 times 1, 6. So you get 11 minus 8 minus 3 and that's exactly equal to 0. And then actually if you go, go and um, <coughs> plug this into the two loop, you also get zero. So B1 also, when you do everything correctly, B1 is also zero, B2 is zero. You're basically seeing the pattern <laughs> that 
And there is some deep underlying reason that there is a sort of deep theoretical reason why this theory has... So this theory is extremely special. It has a, a what we call a line of fixed points. Uh, in other words, this theory is conform... The beta function is not just canceling in the way that we had here, right? Here the cancellation was only for one value of the coupling. So there was like an isolated fixed point, right, at a very special value of g squared n. But in this theory, it means that uh, beta of g, <coughs> beta of g is zero for all g, all g. So that means there is a kind of line of fixed points. So there is a line of fixed points. And this is, I think, there is no analog of this known in four dimensions without, supersymmetry, without uh, supersymmetry. But in, uh, in one plus one dimensions, there are some CFTs with lines of fixed points, but not, not in higher dimensions as far as we know. So it's a very interesting model. You can, uh, now to what extent was, was this reviewed in previous lectures? I'm not, uh, did uh, Andre Starinitz review it? No. Okay, so basically, how, how is the theory structured? Yeah, you can basically write the, the Lagrangian for the bosonic part, just the classical Lagrangian. The question is how do all these fields like fit together and in this n equal four super angles Lagrangian. So S classical will be S is equal to my, uh, integral d4x times uh, minus one half trace f mu squared. And then there will be <coughs> the kinetic terms for these adjoint scalars, which are d mu phi i squared, right? These are just, uh, right, and here i runs from 1 to 6, right? So this index is summed over. And then there is a classical potential, which is plus g young mills. I'm not being, don't trust my signs, but you can easily look this up. Uh, you have trace, uh, yeah, this is also a trace, of course. Then you have trace of phi i commutator phi j squared. And then there are some fermionic terms, plus which I will not, fermionic terms. And this d mu phi, the joint covariant derivative, d mu phi i, is equal to d mu phi i plus i g young mills times a mu commutator with phi i. So you get like all kinds of interesting interactions. And this theory is again of this uh, 12th type where you can take the 12th limit, right? So what you expect is that you can study further this n to infinity limit, keeping, keeping, keeping lambda j young mil squared n fixed. And this is conformal, should be exactly scale invariant or conformal for all lambda. All lambda. So you can study basically what this, so you can compute the scaling dimensions in this theory. This is a, since this is a conformal theory, 
you can start like doing perturbative computations of corrections to operator dimensions, right? So, so what is a really simple operator? Uh, you can, for example, consider. So this this theory has various symmetries. In particular, there is an SO6 symmetry rotating these these phi's, right? So you can consider, for example, a simple operator. Operator. The first one that comes to mind probably is uh, just trace of phi phi i phi i summed over all i. Uh, and this is uh, called Kanishi operator, often called Kanishi operator. OK. And one can, for example, study the dimension of this Kanishi operator, delta Kanishi. And you expect to see some, for example, some function f0 of lambda plus, plus uh, some plus 1 over n squared times f1 of lambda plus dot dot dot. And people have done an incredible job actually studying the dimension of this operator perturbatively. In particular, th this theory has been an amazing resource for people who like doing formalism just for fun. And don't worry about real world too much. <laughs> uh, because it turns out that this planar limit of the theory, the pure large n limit, has some amazing infinite symmetry group. It's called exact integrability. So, so this planar planar limit planar limit uh, has exact integrability. In fact, it, it has some strong similarities with uh, some quantum spin chains, which are solvable via beta ansatz. So it's a bit like some souped-up version of beta ansatz. Have you heard the term beta ansatz? It's basically beta guessed the wave function for the Heisenberg, for just one dimensional Heisenberg spin chain, like many years ago and obtain some exact eigenstates. And so, so this, uh, people play with this a lot. And, and this is especially striking in this leading planar limit. Apparently, if you start looking at these 1 over n squared corrections, at least there is no obvious integrability already. But uh, th this answer is... Uh, can be determined uh, to very high accuracy, and uh, and people d did some kind of mix of various techniques for for Yeah, it's, it was discovered pu purely in the perturbative domain. In fact, the, the integrists mainly do things in the perturbation theory. So they discovered some equations uh, that allow you to essentially develop this perturbative expansion to any desired order. Uh, I think what is known is something like to 11 or 12 loops already using this exact. And this uh, is done by people who are really in just incredibly strong. And they, there are also cross checks through Feynman di diagrams, but also through these exact integrability techniques. So in, my, in this, uh, there is a little bit of the review of this in the Just one second. Oops. 
Yeah, so these lecture notes that I handed out, there is a little bit of review and references of this stuff. This actually goes back even a bit before the ADS CFT correspondence, but uh, but le let me basically write down for you. So, so this delta Kanishi, if you look at this F naught of lambda in the series, and some of this can be dis determined through just completely honest Feynman, but mind-bogglingly complicated Feynman graph calculations. You get. you get uh, the following answer, that this delta Kanishi is 2 plus 12 lambda divided by 4 pi squared minus 48 lambda squared over 4 pi to the 4. And then then the so this is the one loop, this is the two loop, this is the three loop lambda cube over four pi to the six. And then the real life begins at four loops. Because then these coefficients start becoming very transcendental. Like for a while these people were a bit lulled into complacency by just three loops, but at four loops all sorts of new things start showing up. So you get things like plus minus two four nine six or plus five seven six zeta of three minus fourteen forty zeta of five uh, divided by times four pi to the eight. And this is the lambda to the four term. And then people actually do know something like 12 loops. If you really ask them to work hard, they can grind out. I mean, these are like, even coefficients take a lot of space to write down. So up to 12 loops or something. But this is just, uh, this is just planar perturbation theory. And you can say, well, what, what good is this perturbation theory? Can I really? So one amazing thing about planar infinite time perturbation theory is that it's much better behaved than the general perturbation theory. In fact, there is a, because the coefficients here don't blow up as a factorial. They just behave as a geometric series. So this series actually has a finite radius of convergence radius of convergence, which defines uh, the function for, for some region of small lambda. But then what do you do, what do you do beyond that? And that's where the really amazing discovery of the last uh, 20 something years has been that there is a totally different description of this theory via string theory in ADS 5 crosses 5. This I think you probably heard something about. <coughs> so there is, uh, so if you want, if you want, you want to know this function, to know uh, the expansion at large lambda, at large lambda. Uh, it's very hard to use this technique. I mean, you can sort of, I mean, I think they've actually done enough to sort of, just for this operator to do this, but there is an amazing dual description uh, in terms of string theory description using string theory. in ADS 5 crosses 5. And basically, how, how do we know this? Uh, maybe since... Uh, so essentially it was noticed 
I think the key ingredient was the appearance of things called deep brains or Dirichlet brains. It turns out that that this particular Lagrangian is the low low energy effective field theory on uh, so these D brains are things that yeah now this is more just a bit heuristic but if you have a theory of closed strings in 10 dimensions there are these special kind of defects <coughs> lower dimensional defects where when the closed string touches it it can open up and just only have sliding open ends on this D brain. So, so a D brain is characterized by just the dynamics of, uh, of open strings. Like, and for a single D brain, you get exactly n equal for u1 theory, this n equal for supersymmetric u, u1 theory. I don't know. Yeah, well, maybe. Sh yeah, I wanted to yeah. show maybe a few. Yeah, and then. Uh, <coughs> right. Then, then you can consider what happens when you say take two two parallel d brains, and these two parallel d brains now have four types of strings, like the string attached to one of them, the string attached to another, and the other two stretching between them. And the two parallel d brains actually described U2 gauge theory. So if you take n, a stack of n d brains, it basically describes uh, n d3 brains uh, realize UN gauge theory. realize UN. Uh, but the U1 part of this UN is ki uh, kind of trivial, so you can just replace it by SUN. So you get this SUN gauge theory at low energies on the stack of brains. So why is it trivial? Well, it d it's totally decoupled from everything. It's just a free U1. So it does not interact with anything, anything else. So schematically, then, you, you can sort of imagine what happens when, uh, when you put this large number of D-brains on top of each other. And, com and then you would say that this creates some big curving of space-time. Okay? And the curving of space-time is described by a so-called three-brain metric that uh, was already known by, by 95. So so this breakthrough happened due to Polchinski in 95. Polchinski in 1995. And then very soon after, actually, Steve Gobser and I started uh, studying the, the correspondence between the specific three brain case and, uh, and the curved metric. In our first paper with A.W. Pete, we computed the entropy uh, of the curved solution. So uh, let me just exhibit schematically what this curved solution looks like. This curved solution, uh, it's a 10-dimensional metric that you can... So the solution is amazingly simple, actually. The 10-dimensional metric has a function h of the radius. So just think about these three brains sitting like this, and then there is uh, six transverse dimensions to them, right? because there is nine spatial dimensions in total. So you think of these sc six scalar fields are like the transverse fluctuation modes of these brains. That's how you see why there are six of them. And then you can write the following metric, h to the minus one half of r times uh, minus dt squared plus dx vector squared. These are just the coordinates along the brain, plus h one half of r times dr squared plus r squared d. 
And this is just the six-dimensional flat metric. This is the metric of unit uh, of unit S5. Okay? And the crucial thing is that this H is very simple. It uh, just looks like 1 plus L to the 4 divided by R to the 4, where L is some scale factor. So, so if, you if you want to schematically draw what this metric looks like, it looks like a, a kind of throat region which opens up into flat 10-dimensional space. Okay. And this, so this is R, so this is towards R equals zero, and this is towards large R. This is R equal infinity. So the crucial thing is that when R goes to zero, you can just replace this by L to the four divided by R to the four. Right, this one becomes negligible, right, when R is really small. Then this, if I do this replacement here, I will just see, I will get L squared over R squared here, and here I'll get R squared over L squared. And you see that the five sphere just completely decoupled from the rest, right? Because this R squared just canceled. So you get the five sphere of constant radius. And, uh, and the remaining coordinates describe this negatively curved ADS space. So this metric is nothing but the metric of ADS uh, 5 crosses 5. Okay, so that's in a nutshell. It's like comparing a stack of brains with this curved metric and then taking the limit when R goes to zero, which turns out to be like taking the low energy limit in, in this theory. Okay, and then you can start like basically uh, inventing the dictionary uh, between uh, like f the Gobser, Polyakov, and I, and independently Witten. So Maldacena made the basic conjecture that just this uh, R equals zero region describes this conformal field theory. And then we, but even before then, Gobser and I and Saitlin were computing, for example, absorption of signals and finding interesting correspondences between these two pictures. But then, uh, once you have this pure ADS 5 crosses 5 region, you can say that there will be some string modes and there is some relation between the scaling dimension of, of, uh, of this operator in field theory and the mass of the mode and in the string theory. And this relation, which appeared in our paper with Gobser and Polyakov first, was that delta, the scaling dimension delta is equal to 2 plus square root of 4 plus m squared l squared, where this is the mass of a scalar field. The there is for each composite operator there is some scalar field and this is its mass. So, so then uh, using this formula you, you basically learn that when the mass, when this ML squared is large, which turns out to be the situation for this field, you can just do an, another expansion and we obtain the following formula. We, the leading term is just 2 lambda to the 1 quarter. And then there are various corrections, which have been computed by other people much later. But this is teaching you that if you extrapolate this series to large lambda, it's just going to grow like lambda to the 1 quarter. And this is a very generic feature of unprotected operators, because they correspond to to highly massive states. Okay, and this actually has been checked using integrability. You can basically match these two expansions and uh, and obtain very uh, very clear correspondence. Like basically, so there are two expansions, right? This is the strong coupling expansion where you expand in. Uh, uh, 
plus uh, order lambda to the minus 3 quarters. So you, you're using to your advantage this fact that the n equal 4 super and most theory is conformal for any value of lambda. Right, so you can, for example, start uh, then plotting this function f0. Okay. So this f0, it starts out as 2 and just doing something here like this and then eventually it just sort of approaches this lambda to the one quarter behavior. Here there is a just perturbative series that I wrote down. This is as a function of lambda. Right, so, so this is like has been an amazing sort of toy model for all, all, a lot of things. And as you heard, some people are also, if you think of this model as finite temperature, which is actually what we were doing first, it also tells you something about strongly coupled entropy and free energy of this plasma. That is actually described by kind of black hole in ADS space. I think you already heard, heard about this from, from, from Andre, right? So that, that is, has been extremely fruitful because it, it, um, yeah, it allows for some totally different picture of how to compute transport coefficients in strongly coupled plasma and it was very instructive. Yeah, so, so maybe I'll just flash a couple of slides just to reinforce what I, what I just said. Uh, So, so this is the, in a nutshell, this is the picture of gauge gravity duality. On one side, you have the stack of brains with open strings giving them dynamics. On the other side, you have this curved metric. And the what propagates, so it's a little bit like reformulation of large N theory in terms of purely gauge invariant observables, like something like what we did in the SCORM model, right? But now, it's done in, in a totally different setting in this, and much more precisely. Here, there is very precise control over these expansions. This theory is certainly not, not uh, confining, right? It's an exactly scale invariant theory, but there are variants that, that are confining. Uh, and the crucial thing that actually we discovered in 1996 with Gobser and A.W. Pete is that one basic factor, a fact that makes it fly is that this L to the 4 is related to Toft coupling. So, so when you make L to the 4 very large, it's like the weakly curved space, which appears for very large Toft coupling. So this gives you a, an expansion this is what allows you to develop this large lambda expansion. And the other expansion is just in Feynman diagrams. So this is a very special simplification for this theory that occurs at large 12 coupling that's not available in a generic large N theory. It's a bit of a miracle that this is why people could do so much more for, for this theory, this availability of large lambda limit. And uh, and this uh, yeah this was supposed to be a joke uh, you know the spherical cow joke but uh, here it's a hy hyperbolic cow but <laughs> <laughs> well, the crucial <laughs> yeah the crucial part of this space is of course the the hyperbolic ADS space and this. <laughs> Right, and, uh, and this I already mentioned, some tests of... Uh, so, so one thing that we learned, uh, I think th there are some sort of big lessons from this. Like, uh, one is that string theory really is a theory of something, right? It's a very uh, concrete statement that string theory tells us what's going on with this field theory at very strong coupling. 
I'm not sure that's what you always wanted to know, but but <laughs> at least it's a very concrete it's a very concrete uh, lesson from string theory. Uh, it can make definite testable predictions, and some of them were tested using this apparatus of integrability, like being able to continue these extrapolate things from weak coupling and match on to what string theory told us. Uh, and, uh, and this has appeared, there are several such amazing tests. I, this Kanishi one is maybe the most elaborate, but there were also similar tests for, uh, for high spin operators, for these so-called Wilson operators. Okay, so I think uh, since everyone is probably a little bit <laughs> tired for today, maybe a good time to stop for questions. Uh. <laughs>
like people have found sound waves, people found v viscosity, like, well, uh, Starinets is one of the people who first computed viscosity, found why this viscosity is uh, very low and stuff like that. So, so it's been very, very kind of interesting physics came out from that line. I should say that uh, m my initial plan was uh, to talk a bit about these tensor models that are in my notes, but uh, I thought it was fun to talk about uh, more traditional large end limits too, and especially, you know, to connect to other lectures in the school. So if you still want to read about tensor models, you can read the la later sections of my notes. But Well, we still, uh, at least w the limit we can study is still uh, weakly curved. So, so there is, uh, in some sense, it's different in the following sense that in QCD you start with this asymptotically free theory, uh, and and then it, uh, the interaction strength sort of grows towards the infrared, but does not get ridiculously large either, right? But in this theory, even far in the UV, the both gauge groups are actually strong. You can keep them strongly interacting. They both flow, but they both stay sort of strongly interacting. So you never see, you see lo log logarithmic flow, but you don't see the true asymptotic freedom in that theory. So part on model mm -hmm. Yeah, at least not in the limit where the supergravity solution applies. So I'm doing the full disclosure. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, could you repeat what was the reason that uh, different strength Well, that theory, it's an intricate theory where there are two gauge groups. Uh, like there is SUN group and SUM group. And they sort of flow in opposite directions logarithmically. Uh, because of uh, n equal 1 supersymmetry, you know the exact Schiffman Weinstein be beta functions. So you have pretty good control over the flow, even when both groups are strongly coupled. So you can use these beta functions even in the strongly coupled regime. It, it's different from what I was saying about uh, QCD, right, where you really have a fully perturbative regime. But so as you, there is uh, something rather complicated that goes on called the duality cascade, where these groups kind of start... You, there are these cyborg duality transformations that change the number of colors, and this happens repeatedly. So far in the UV, the theory is very unconventional, sort of. It's not like the usual nearly free QC QCD, right? But far in the infrared, it is definitely confining. There, there's no question about it.